Well, good morning. I don't know if I'm live. There you go. Good morning. It's, uh, it's great to hear. Great to hear so much bubbling life and conversation. I don't know about you, but I, I feel encouraged. I feel full already from what we've heard, from what we've done together. To hear your voices singing together is a great delight. Thank you, Bethany, and thank you, Elwyn, um, for, for sharing. That's a great encouragement into, into really what it means to not just be church on a Sunday, but to be church in our lives, yeah, at Japanese restaurants, at, you mean, at home. It's kind of like what we were talking about last week. You I mean, when you gather, each one has a gift. You let all things be done for building up. What is ministry? Where is ministry? It doesn't matter where it is. It could be in a Japanese restaurant. It could be in a home in a church building, what is it, is, is the encouragement and the spurring one of, of one another. I'm encouraged. I'm, I'm privileged to be here this morning. I'm, I'm incredibly humbled to be able to share uh, with you as part of my, my responsibilities here. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited because it's Advent. Now, Advent, as a preacher, right, is one of those things that's, that's incredibly exciting but incredibly challenging because you, you preach on the same passages every single year. Now, if you've been in church for 10 years, that means you've heard 10 years worth of Christmas messages. If you've been in church for a bit longer than 10 years, you mean that means you've heard, you can fill in the blank, that many years of Christmas messages. But I tell you, I, I was reading this passage that we're going to look at today, and it's something not overly profound, but to me it just struck my, my, my attention. And I, I looked and I went, wow, really interesting. And then I've chewed and I've wrestled. Yeah, a new passage, uh, not a new passage for me, but a new wrestle for me. And, and I'm telling you, this has been a, a two-week kind of chewing and, and munching of thoughts yeah, and, and, and feelings and, and questionings and flicking all around the place. So I, I encourage you, I know it can be easy to be like, oh, shepherds, we've read that before. Um, but to read, read this passage with an open mind of, God, what do you want to say to me in this space? Now, I've left my Bible down here, but I'm going to grab it. Luke 2. Open your, open your Bible. Now, we're in Luke 2. I will read the Niv. Luke 2, verses 6 to 20. So, it's... Joe and, and Mary have gone, gone to Bethlehem. While they were there, verse, verse 6 of Luke 2, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels have left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Well, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which were just as they'd been told. So there you go. So even, even as I read it now, there's things where I go, oh, I didn't actually notice that before. If we look at... Um, if we look at the shepherds, what I find interesting is comparing the before and the after of the shepherds. So what was and what is? It, it seems very mundane, but there were shepherds out by in the fields at night. There were shepherds, they were doing their job, 
which is to look after their sheep, they were chilling out in a field. And the line that struck me was this line in verse 20, right? It's the three words, and it sounds kind of a bit odd that, that this is, I mean, what, what grabs my attention, but the three words, the shepherds returned, right? So what, what was, there were shepherds in the fields at night, and then, you mean, fast forward, they have this amazing experience, and then, and then what is, going forward, the shepherds returned. They were still shepherds. They still went back to their fields. I mean, it might have still been night. We don't, we don't know. But yeah, like there they was still day. There was still night. They still had to deal with rain in, in winter or in summer, if you're in Melbourne. You mean, they still had to deal with I mean, the cold weather. They still had to deal with, with the animals. They, they were shepherds in the field. That, that didn't change. So before and after, what was, what was the difference? Before they were still shepherds, after they were still shepherds, there was only one thing that changed. And if you saw them from a visual distance, there was nothing that changed. But what changed was my terrible clip art that I'd done here, right? So here's the game, and it's not a very hard game, but you know the game in like the newspaper of Spot the Difference, where there's like, you're in seven differences, there's one difference in this picture, and I, I really hope you can spot it, all right? So what, what is the difference, is the question. The difference is, is the shepherds had, had, had experienced, amidst the ordinary, something extraordinary. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But the shepherds had experienced joy. Okay? That was the essence of what, what it brought about this, this smile. When we see that smile, we're, we're talking about joy in this context. Uh, the, the angel promised them, she, she said, I'm going to bring good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The angel said, I'll bring good news that will cause great joy. So the angels proclaimed, how can I be so confident that the shepherds received this joy? It's a good question, right? Because the, the, the shepherds return to the field. What do they do? Glorifying and praising God. It doesn't say the shepherds return to the field with smiles on their face, or the shepherds return to the fields with you mean, happy, happiness in their, in their hearts. But the angels promise that there's joy. And I would suggest... Um, I would suggest there's a link between joy and glory. So, so the shepherds returned praising or glorifying and praising God. That's what the text says. Okay? And that's how I know there, there is an intrinsic link between joy and glory. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to look at these two words. And we're going to kind of unpack the two words, glory first, probably more in depth, and then joy second. And then we're going to ask, what, what's the actual intersection between the two? Uh, are, they, are they kind of inclusive? Are they exclusive? How do they interact together? So here we go. The first question, right? What does the word glory mean? It's an interesting one. It's a word we use in lots of songs. It's a word we use all the time. But what does the word glory mean? If you had to describe it to someone that had never heard it before, what does the word glory mean? Here you go. Here's your time to, to shine or to be confused together. Why don't you turn to whoever you sit next to I'll give you one minute to see what, what the best synonym or the best definition or, or what kind of your understanding of the word glory is, and I'd love to hear a couple of thoughts uh, in a moment. So, so go for it.
How'd you go? What, what were some of, the, some of the things? We were reflecting, Braden was reflecting. It's hard to pin it down. Like, I've got lots of thoughts in here, but like, what actually is it? I don't know. Any, any thoughts that people were like, oh, that was, I mean, you can dub your, dub your buddy in. And that word reveals God. So, so for those who couldn't hear that, glory is to reveal the true nature of God. And, and made a very accurate point that it's kind of hard to define because to define that, it's like, how do you define the true nature of God? Like, wow, that's beyond comprehension. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, Ross? It's, 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 shared, it's shared. It's not stolen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so with, with glory, there's this, this mutualness to it that, that there's this almost the glorifying makes something more glorious. It, um, it's the acknowledgement or the agreement of the, of the glory. Yeah, maybe one, one more. John. Light. Interesting. You've, you've been reading Luke too, haven't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you, do you notice when, when, the, um, uh, when the angel appears and the glory of the Lord shun around them. What do, you, what do you picture that as? Like, you know, I don't necessarily have a concrete answer for this, but, but I'm just kind of thinking, like, and the glory of the Lord shun around them. To me, it's some kind of illumination, this kind of, like, moment. They were terrified. Yeah? Not only were these angelic beings all of a sudden, you mean, like, singing like a heavenly choir, right? That's enough to terrify me. But the glory of the Lord, God's glory himself, shun around them. And so when we get glory, there's, there's a level of illumination. Here we go. So, um, glory in Luke 2. We got three different ones. Um, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shun around them, and they were terrified. So is that kind of some light, or is that kind of illumination? M- maybe. These are all kind of just suggestions, right? Uh, ver- down in verse 13, the second appearance of glory in Luke 2, our passage for today, Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace on whom his favor rests. So is there an element in which this kind of glory is this praise, or this declaration, or this affirmation of, yes, yes, you are this God. You are worthy of our song. And the last one, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God. You mean, worship, I guess. Then again, we could ask the question, what is worship? It's yeah, um, so kind of this, this, this ongoing cycle. But the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God. We look in the New Testament, th- there's lots, okay? It, lots and lots of different passages. We, we, could, we could actually spend the whole day just looking at the different passages. And then again, in, in the Old Testament, yeah, um, I was saying to these guys before, the Old Testament, the word kavod for glory is literally like a heaviness or a weight, which we would often consider like something that's valuable um, or something that's worth So we would say like, you mean, uh, uh, to, to own a house has a level of heaviness, glory, because there's a, there's a weight to it. Um, or to, to lose a, a loved one has a level of, of weight to it. There's, there's this weighty heaviness there, um, or to eat too much Christmas pudding has a level of glory to it as well, um, but, not, but not in kind of the spiritual sense, just in, in the kavod sense of the, of the word. But we won't, we won't go there too much today. We'll go to the New Testament. Matthew 24, verse 30. So this is Jesus on his trial, right? And he's talking to the, to the uh, I think it's the, the chief priest at this point, possibly, or it might be, might be later on. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Great triumph, maybe? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand, one at your left, in your glory. In your presence? In your glory? John 2, verse 11, this is after the water at the wine, the first miracle that Jesus publicly did. What Jesus did here in in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. He revealed his power, his supernatural power to turn, turn water into wine. Romans 3.23, I find this is an interesting one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have short and fall of the illumination of God, that kind of doesn't make sense, the, 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 the triumph of God, maybe, maybe not, maybe, maybe the, the perfection of God. 
And we all who with unfailed, unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We contemplate the Lord's glory. With unveiled faces, we contemplate the Lord's glory. We see His face. We're going to talk later about, about Moses, how he wasn't able to see God's glory, to see His face. So His person. But we're being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, godliness maybe, which comes from the Lord. So here you go. Anyway, so I spent a good couple of hours kind of chewing through all these definitions and trying to get my head around it. And I came up with something that was highly complex and super theological. Wow. Right? <laughs> that was the best that I could come up with. And, and no, this is not kind of a full yeah, understanding of it. I, I'm very, very aware of that. But, but this to me kind of captured a lot of these things. Right? If you saw this amazing light in the sky, you know, say a sunset, right? The, the radiant color across the sky. Wow would be kind of your, your natural response. If God revealed himself to you, you would go, wow. Like, that would be your natural response. Like, you look at, like, Isaiah 6. You look at Daniel in his vision. You look at John in his vision. There's this sense of, like, this, you mean, like, and fittingly so. There's this wowness that goes there. With, with a sense of power, there's a sense of wow. With a sense of, you mean, all, all those other kind of, kind of ones. Something inherently worthy of our wow is what I would consider something as, as glorious, or something as carrying glory, carrying weight. As I was looking in, um, in this, I kind of saw two categories of glory. The first being God's presence himself. Like I was saying, kind of if, we, if we encountered fully the presence of God, which we will one day, there's going to be this, this, this moment, an ongoing reality of just this wowness. Right? So the very presence of God very clearly carries with it His glory. But then also, there's the fingerprints of God. Now, I don't mean literally God's kind of fingerprints. I mean like you know, His outworkings, so, so His creation. Now, that could be a sunset. There's an inherent glory in a sunset. We look at that and we go, wow, or you mean a fire, right? You, you watch fire and you're fascinated by it. There's this, there's this wowness, there's this beauty to it, there's this amazement to it. You marvel at, at a fire. It might be people, yeah? I would say if we're, we're made in the image of God, we are reflectors of God, we carry an inherent glory within us. We, we reflect to others the image of God, and that's a beautiful thing. It might be places, it might be personalities, it might be I mean, physics or something. You look at the way something works and you go, wow, that's amazing. Like, how did, how did God design such a universe that, you mean, if I do this, that will happen? Like, it's quite, quite a remarkable thing. Here's a couple of passages to talk about this, this expression of, of glory. So the first is Exodus 33. And this is one of those ones like I'd love to do a series on, right? I just find it fascinating, but we're going to spend about a minute on it. No, that's okay. Exodus 33, verses 18 to 23. This is talking about the presence of God as his glory. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. So that's Moses' request. Oh, I would like to see your glory, please, God. If I haven't seen it yet, reveal it to me. And the Lord said, I'll cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. So I'll reveal these things to you, my goodness, my name. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And I wonder if you know, see my face is the full expression of revealing God's glory. Then the Lord said, and it kind of affirms it down, down here, verse 21. Then the Lord said, there is a place nearby where you may stand on a rock. When my glory, so when my glory, what, what is that passes by? When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. So you can picture it. You mean, Moses is sitting you mean, in, in a rock, kind of like this little inlet kind of cave kind of thing. And he says, when my glory passes by... I'll, I'll put my hand there so that you don't, you don't see it. I'll cover you with my hand until I have passed by. When my glory passes by, yeah, I'll cover you with my hand until I pass by. The glory is God himself, the full presence of God, the face of God himself. Then I'll remove my hand and you'll see my back, but my face must not be seen. What Moses saw, I would love to know. Right? I just think that would be just like to, 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 to be there, even just to watch from a distance would be fascinating. 
right? Let's say one day, one day we will. We'll see in his, in his fullness. We will see face to face. And that's a remarkable thing. What Moses didn't get to see, we will see. The full expression of God's glory. So God's presence carries with it his glory. The second part is God's fingerprints. We know this because Psalm 19 talks to the fact that the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. The heavens don't literally, I mean, form the face of God, right? So it's not the presence of God kind of in that respect, but they show the fingerprints of God all around it. P- prior to studying at Bible college, I was studying you know, uh, physiotherapy, and, and in that, it was an anatomy and, and just kind of general science, and I found it fascinating. The more I studied of the way the body worked, the more I could see the fingerprints of God all over. The, the more I would look at my cells when I go, this is, this is remarkable. There, there, there is this amazing glory in the fact that I am, I am an image bearer of God, created, created by God. It's quite, quite remarkable. And I would see that, see that in other people too. When we see a, an amazing landscape, we go, wow. You know, stars in the sky at night, sunset on the beach, some cool mountainous rock formation. When we eat a delicious meal, we go, wow. I I see the fingerprints of God on that, right? Because God could have just designed a meal for us to be something, you mean, consume it to nourish you so that you can function and do more stuff. But no, God designed it so that we had taste buds that could savor and enjoy a good meal. Wow. You mean, have you ever eaten eaten a good meal and gone, that was amazing? Like, how cool was that? That was was delicious. That was remarkable. Or a painting, right? I'm not not an art gallery kind of person, and, and that's okay. But, but I, I have friends that are, and, and when we go on holidays, I go with them, right, because they're there and I'm an extrovert, so I'm where the people are, and that's fun. But, but they take me there, and, and I watch them appreciate these paintings, and, and it brings me to a greater appreciation of the paintings, and I sit and I go, wow, once this was just this blank white piece of paper, right? But now it's filled with colour and filled with light. And to the artists in the room, you've got a beautiful gift from God. Because once there was nothing, and then God breathed forth creation, right? He's the ultimate painter. And so when we paint, we reflect the glory of God. And that's quite a remarkable thing. And we we can see the glory of God in the fingerprints of what we we can, can bring. So that's glory. Let's go to joy, then we'll link it together. I think when we experience joy in the presence of God, in our intimacy with Him, that should naturally... um, I didn't talk about... I didn't talk about that. That's okay. There's a link. There's arrows there, right? When we experience glory, like when when we, we marvel at who God is, and then we see that in creation, there's kind of this extra appreciation of it. If the two were separate, you mean, we'd, we'd be missing something, yeah, um, and, and vice versa. When we see something in creation, right, it would be remiss of us to go, wow, this is amazing, the way God's designed food, or the way God's designed my body, or the way God's designed, you mean, the creation, or the ocean, or the physics, and how things work. It would be remiss of us to see that, and wow at that, and leave it there, right? Because that's just a partial glory. It meets its kind of full expression when we, when we go, wow, God, you are amazing. Okay, sorry, that was, that was that. Categories of joy. God's presence, God's fingerprints, very much the same thing, that they, they're designed to, to complement each other. When we, when we have, a, have an intimacy with the Father, that, that should feed into an enjoyment of his creation. It, it's kind of, um, the way I, way I picture it, is we walk along, I mean, the, the closest depiction of this is, is Genesis well, Genesis 3, it talks about, by that time the falls happened. But you mean, as, as God was walking in the garden, so we get this narrative that, that Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. And if you picture, you mean literally God walking with someone, like picture going for a walk with someone, you're walking with God, and then you, mean, you go over here and you have, you have this you mean, peach or something, and you go, oh, oh, it's delicious, thank you God for creating this. You mean, and so that the enjoyment... The deep satisfaction of, of what you're consuming and what you're partaking in or the land that you're, you're working on. The fact that you're walking with God, there's this, this deeper enjoyment because of it. You could still have the peach. The peach would still be delicious. I mean, you, you don't have to be a believer to enjoy a peach, right? A peach is inherently wonderful. I, I think it is. Um, but, but when you're walking with God, there's this like, man, you made this. This is amazing. Thank you for that. That's really cool. And then, and then you go on together. So there's not only the enjoyment of the company and the presence with one another, 
but there's the enjoyment of, of what he's created for us to enjoy, and we, we enjoy them more when they're, they're together. All right. Here we go. Now we can slow down a little bit. I know we've been, been that's, that's a lot to kind of process, but I wanted to get, get to this. What's the link between joy and glory? Right? So both with joy and glory, there's something of the inherent, you know, ultimate expression of, of joy or glory in the presence of God himself. And then there's something of it reflected in his creation for us also to enjoy and us also to appreciate his glory. But, but, but what's the, the link between joy and glory? If you think of the shepherds, you mean, the angel promise that I will cause great joy. You mean, I've got this good news, this message about Jesus, it's going to cause great joy in verse 10 or whatever it is, and then down in verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God. What actually is the link between the two? And here's what I've reflected on. We glorify what we enjoy. We glorify. We agree that something is inherently worthy of our wow. Right, that's what it means to glorify. We, we, we affirm, we, we declare, this is, this is indeed wow. So, so we wow, or we, we have a, a wowing, or whatever you want to you know, make up the word for there. We glorify what we enjoy. And when we experience joy, on the flip side, we also praise or bring glory. At the, at the rock wall at the, that's up up there, the top top left one. It's, that's organ pipes. It's, it's kind of an hour and a half, I don't know, north. We went there for an excursion um, the other day with, with the year eight students at Donvale. And, and I was walking along um, with a, a fellow teacher talking about all sorts of, of weird and wonderful things and, and kind of just watching the path. There was lots of ants there and stuff. And then, and then I looked up. Now, he'd been here before. I looked up and, and without even thinking, wow. That, that was my, my instinctive response. Right? It just blurt like it was like it just kind of and, and then I apologized to him. I'm I'm sorry I interrupted you. Like you know, I was I was wanting to be a good listener and he was talking and I was you know listening, listening. Wow, like completely not listening. Like this is amazing, right? You can't kind of fully appreciate it there, but it was just this bizarre rock formation. And, and he said to me, No, no, that's actually that's okay, because that's really interesting. Last year it was me in your place walking with another teacher, and I did the exact same thing. It is wow, isn't it? There's something of an inherent beauty in it that's just, wow. You mean God's fingerprints all over it. And you mean, as, as I wowed, I actually enjoyed it. There was a deep sense of, of this is amazing. And, and it made me feel joyful. Oh, this is cool. And, and I, I went close to it. There was the other side of a river, unfortunately, so you couldn't kind of climb up it. Um, but I, you mean, I was looking at the rocks and looking at it, and then the kids were talking about, oh, how was it made and how was it formed? And there was just this excitement in the glory of it. And, and that's the closest example that I can, I can think of, of when in our fingerprints of God's side, when joy and glory kind of cross over. It, to me, was just clear as, clear as day. When we experience, when we taste, when we see something wow, you know, something worthy or of, of inherent, inherent praise, something quite remarkable, we, we often, I would say, enjoy it. Children do this really well. All right, kids, kids, I think, reflect the link between glory and praise, sorry, glory and joy better than we do. I don't know if you've ever um, taken a, a gift to a child in a big box, right, and it's a really expensive gift. You've been working really hard to save up to buy this gift, and you buy them this gift, and they open it up, and they take the gift out, and they put the gift down, and then they spend the rest of the day playing with the box, Right? Has anyone had that experience? And they're just fascinated by the, wow, it's so big. You mean it's so, t- I can jump in it. I can jump at, kind of out of it. You mean I might need some help. I'm stuck. We could play hide and seek. I could hide in the box. Mom, can you put me in the box so I can hide in the box and then you go away and I'll shut the lid and then you've got to find me. Right? And, it's, and then you found me. Wow, this is amazing. Right? And so as they look at this box, for them in, in their mind, it's just amazing. There's an inherent wowness to this. It's huge. It's massive. It's the potential. It's so exciting. And because of that, as they, they glorify this box, as it were, as they wow at this box, they get a deep enjoyment with the box. It sounds very, very superficial, but, but do you see what, that's what I mean? The, the two kind of collide. Or another example that I, I see um, 
uh, probably more, more often, is you go, hey, let's go to the playground, right? Because kids love playgrounds. My wife loves playgrounds. So let's go to playgrounds, right? And, and we go to a playground, and we're like, whoa, there's a cool new slide that they've built, or you know, there's some new kind of feature, and I'm like, they're going to love this. And then the kid, all they do is they spend the entire time following a little ant around, right? Have, have you ever seen something? Or, or they'll sit there, and they'll, wow, and they'll give it a name, and they'll become their friend, and they'll, they'll try, to, try to pick it up, and they'll watch, and, and they'll appreciate Wow, you mean that little blade of grass? It climbs up that little blade of grass. You mean, oh wow, look at mum, mum, it's picking up food. It's like the size of it and it's carrying the food back. Imagine me carrying the size of me like in food, right? That's about what I eat in a day, right? Uh, but, but it's carrying this, carrying this all the way back. Man, they're playing together, mum. Look at them, they're playing together, right? There, there's something of the beauty that they see God's creation as glorious, as wow, the beauty in it. And they notice often what we don't, right? We would have passed straight by that ant. We probably would have gone, oh, dear, get off me, you silly thing, right? You mean, like, we would have passed straight by. But they go, no, I want to be, pre- wow, this is amazing. And they enjoy it, right? The ant, you know, isn't kind of giving it anything. Like, it's not like it's talking back to it, right? But there's this, this appreciation of, of the beauty of God's creation, and that's wow. And as the child stops and sits with that, they experience the joy of it. And I think in, in life, often we, we are rushing or we are moving so quickly and so distractedly in our minds that we don't stop and appreciate the beauty of the creation that's around us. We don't stop and appreciate the fingerprints of God that are everywhere in creation, out there, in the created, in here. And we don't appreciate it. We sit over a meal from someone and we just appreciate, wow, the stories and the experiences that you've had of the things God's done in your life. Wow, that's so cool. I mean, I see God, the glory of God in your life, and I, I enjoy sharing a meal with you. I, I think there's, there's an important thing to just slow down, to, to, to try to still our mind and appreciate. I was chatting, chatting with a good friend during the week, and he, and he made the comment of, they, they, it's a telling story, they were, they were going on this walk once, and they saw this view, and, and the friend said to, to my friend, he said, I want you to count how many different colour greens you see in this view. How many different colours? I mean, you, you could really do it now. Like, we could, we could do it actually. Look out the window. How many different colours? And you would go, one, there's green, right? But then you stop and you look, or you pick up a single leaf, and you look at a single leaf. How many different shades? How many different tints of green? How many different specks of of you mean know, fragments of other different colors are in there. And you go, God could have just designed the leaf to be green. You mean know, just kind of like paintbrush green. That's probably what I would have done, right? You mean know, it's much more efficient that way. But no, God goes, I, I'm, a, I'm a creative God, and I want my glory, my wow, to be manifest in my creation. And so I'm gonna fill this with so much life and so much color that when you sit and you look at it, you go, wow. Like imagine if the sky was just blue all the time. Like, it'd be cool. Right? It's still huge, right? That's amazing. But, but there would not be this, this inherent beauty in it. The wow, or you know, C.S. Lewis was, was much more sophisticated than me. He said the praise. Um, but, but the wow is what I've substituted in there. The praise of the wow, the wow expresses and completes our joy. For me, it was this moment that I affirmed what I'm seeing is inherently remarkable is inherently beautiful, is inherently a reflector of the image of God, is inherently, you mean, whatever it might be, our definition of glory. It is wow, and I agree with that. When I expressed that at the rock wall, there was an enjoyment there. When a child expresses that, you mean, with its new friend, the ant, it experiences the joy. The, the, the acknowledgement that something is glorious completes our joy. As we get an in- intersection of all, all the things working together. As we experience the joy in creation, kind of like the image of God walking before with the peach, right? As we experience the joy in creation, this, this, we look at the trees and we go, this leaf is amazing. That should encourage us to go back and go, wow, God, you are amazing as a creator. Yeah, as we experience different personalities in people, that should encourage us to go back to God and go, wow, God, you are, you are such a diverse person. You mean, you've, you've got so much of your character that I haven't yet experienced. And then that, you mean, God, help me be aware to your creation. As we sit with him, 
that then encourages us to go back out and be more attentive to the beauty that's around us, to the glory in his creation. The heavens declare the glories of God. We, we do most of our life in things that we might call mundane or things that we might call ordinary or normal. You know, how many times, you know, how was your week? It was just another, another normal week. Yeah? And, and then, practically, if that's true, you, you probably you know, didn't change jobs this week. You probably didn't you know, go on some exotic... You, know, you might have, but like most of our, our weeks are kind of just the same cogs turning over and over and over again. And that's good. That's healthy. That's, that's normal kind of, kind of rhythms of life. But what I noticed about the shepherds is that the shepherds went from being the normal cogs to the normal cogs. But something was different. They had a joy in that. And I wonder if the shepherds lay down under the stars that night after they'd experienced that encounter with Jesus and went, God, you're amazing, right? You've revealed your son to us and, and your stars. And they've had this new appreciation of the stars. They were still chilling out, looking after their sheep. They were still doing the ordinary things. But there was something that was, that was extraordinary. They had this joy there. All with their fellow shepherds. You know, all the people they talked to, there was this newfound enthusiasm for life. Joy brings extraordinary amidst the ordinary. The shepherds experienced the joy of the wow of Jesus. And we'll not see that. The shepherds saw Jesus. And because they saw Jesus, they learned to see things differently. They see the extraordinary in the ordinary. Kind of, kind of the child moment. They see the extraordinary. This is remarkable. This is beautiful. I'm sitting at my computer doing my normal job, right? But I get to interact with another person made in the image of God. That is, that is quite amazing. That is quite a remarkable privilege. I mean, it's just another Sunday at church, right? I rock up, I sit in my chair, I chat to some people. But you get to act, in, interact with, with brothers and sisters that will one day you know, sit beside you in eternity. That's, that's pretty remarkable. It's quite amazing. And we get to do that all the more with the presence of God dwelling within us. So, so that image of walking with God in the garden actually is, is better than that. Right? Adam and Eve walking with God in the garden. God's out here. You know? For us, we walk with God in here. And so as we, as we go, the encouragement is to consider where we see the fingerprints of God around us. To, in, in the ordinary. right? Not, not to, you know, okay, we need to go and find it somewhere else. We need to go I mean, on this, this super long drive or we need to do this radical life. No, no, no. But to look for how God's at work around us amidst the ordinary. The shepherds. I mean, it was just an ordinary night for them. And, and to then stop and sit with that and go, God, thank you for that. I see the glory in what you've created here. And, and I'm agreeing that, that you as the creator are glorious. Jesus says these words, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. These things pertain to walking with me that image of walking with God. As we do that, my joy may be in you, because I'll be in you, and your joy may be full to glorify me in my creation. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Let's stop and, and pray. I invite the band band up. I just want to give you an opportunity to think back on your last week and go on, God, I, I acknowledge you were at work, whether I saw it or not. As I sift through some of the things I saw and experienced last week, help me see where you were at work. Is there something you want me to notice that you go, oh, I was trying to get your attention there and I missed it because I was distracted or I was busy? Where did I skip over your fingerprints? And then as I look ahead to this week, where do you want me to notice your fingerprints? As I skip ahead to this week, how is it you would call me to cl walk closer with you to enjoy these fingerprints together?
these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Father, may we experience that.